Well, howdy folks. Here we are with our last installment of uh, Labs from the Barn. Uh, as much fun as this has been, I'm afraid it's all coming to an end. Uh, so anyway, we're, today we're going to do a quick uh, radiation exercise with you. I was going to say demonstration, but I don't have the Geiger counter here to demonstrate, I'm afraid. But we are going to show you a little bit about balance and nuclear equations. So we'll do a half-life problem or two uh, and have you do a little bit of a graph. Uh, to, to figure out a half-life and I'll supply the graph paper But first let's go to the blackboard. I just want to talk a little bit about the background uh, and and particulars of alpha beta and gamma decay All right, well this discussion on nuclear stability and again I don't know how far the other lecture instructors went into this so I'll make this quick But there are things that point to, to circumstances that bring about nuclear stability. We've collected a lot of a lot of evidence about this. And a couple of the things have to do with even and even numbers of protons and neutrons. It turns out statistically if you have an even number of protons and neutrons that that you're very likely going to be a stable nucleus as opposed to odd and odd. And I think we saw this with electrons. We saw electrons, since they have a spin, they like to uh, quantum spin. They like to pair up when they're in the same orbital. Apparently, the nucleons that are in the nucleus of an atom also have a quantum spin and like to pair up and apparently are more stable when they're paired and less likely to eject part of the nucleus in order to bring about stability. There's also something called the shell model of the nucleus that points to the fact that that just like the electron shells, the nucleons arrange themselves in shells. And when a shell gets filled, that that's particularly stable. They refer to the filled shell numbers as the magic numbers. I like the fact they use magic numbers. But it turns out those magic numbers are 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, and for the neutrons also 126. But it turns out if they have that number of protons or neutrons, it turns out to be unusually stable. And again, that's why they refer to them as, as the magic numbers. And so, again, there's certain things that we can look at a nucleus, look at a nuclear symbol for an atom, and kind of predict, you know, whether or not we think it might be radioactive. Now, one thing we have noticed, though, that when you start to get too many protons in one place, the nucleus definitely gets unstable. So if you have an atomic number, greater than 83, that's too many protons. And suddenly, the nucleus wants to eject as many protons as it can to get itself under that 83 mark. All right, so there's some mechanisms by which a nucleus can bring about its own stability. So let's quickly just look at those three mechanisms that we're gonna look at today in lab. Okay, the first mechanism by which a nucleus can spit out part of itself in order to bring about nuclear stability is alpha decay. Generally happens with those atomic isotopes that are a, a atomic number greater than 83. Because again, this is the quickest way to get rid of, of, of protons. Turns out an alpha particle is made up of a, a little cluster of two protons and two neutrons. It looks exactly like a helium nucleus stripped of its electrons. So it's like a helium plus two. Well, they give it the symbol, the Greek alpha, and with our nuclear symbols, we always include the atomic number and the mass number, so it would be a two and a four, given the it's got four nucleons and two of them are protons. Or sometimes you'll actually see them use the helium nucleus for that. Now again, typically uh, elements that are atomic number 83 or greater, or 84 or greater, emit these alpha particles. And so to show you real quickly how easy it is to write out a nuclear reaction for an alpha decay, for instance, radium. Radium-226, a notorious alpha emitter. All right, well, in writing out a nuclear equation, the only thing that, that the only rule that really uh, governs this whole thing is that, that the number of protons has to be conserved on both sides of the arrow. So if it spits out an alpha particle that's got two protons in it, then clearly it lost two of those 88, which creates a daughter isotope, and that's what they call these, the parent isotope and the daughter isotope. The daughter isotope would only have 86 protons, which identifies it immediately from the periodic table as radon. 
Now, granted, we could find out which isotope of radon because the mass numbers likewise have to be conserved on both sides of the arrow. So 226, it lost four of those mass units. This is radon 222 that was produced. All right, well, the isotope that we're going to use, and we'll cut to the report sheet here in a little bit, that we were going to use for our alpha source was polonium-210. Again, if you look up the atomic number for polonium, you'll see that it's not too daunting a task. Excuse me. <coughs> a little chalk dust there. Not too daunting a task to come up with the daughter isotope that's produced when the polonium gives, gives off its alpha particle. Now again, I should point out that this happens with isotopes, atomic number uh, greater than 83. Alpha particles, though, are not very penetrating. In our demonstration, uh, they would have been stopped with just a sheet of notebook paper. They're kind of heavy, kind of slow. So again, not very penetrating, but very dangerous if inhaled or ingested. And the problem is that, remember I said that they're stripped of their electrons, so it's a helium plus two. That's a very strong oxidizing agent can cause the formation of free radicals in organic compounds. That's where it cleaves a, an organic bond and leaves an odd electron on these little fragments. Those little free radicals are like little junkyard dogs and they'll tear you up. So this is why exposure to alpha radiation, not necessarily in your best interest. All right, well, let's look at another mechanism. Okay, this mechanism, beta decay, this happens when elements or isotopes have too many neutrons to be stable. It turns out there's some isotopes that exist in nature of like chlorine, for instance, chlorine-40. Now, chlorine-40 uh, has more neutrons than the normal isotopes that you find of chlorine. Most of the chlorine in nature is either chlorine-35 or chlorine-37. It either has 18 neutrons or 20 neutrons because it has 17 protons. But chlorine-40 has an abundance of neutrons in it and consequently is a little unstable. It wants to have a few fewer neutrons. Well, this is when beta decay happens. Now, this is what's interesting. A beta particle looks like an electron. It's got a negative one charge on it. It's got a, a mass very similar to an electron, about one two thousandth of a Dalton of an AMU. But it seems to originate in the nucleus. Now, that should raise an eyebrow or two because we were taught there are no electrons in the nucleus. There's protons and neutrons there. The electrons are in orbit around it. But this seems to originate from the nucleus. Now, here's the proposal. Is that a neutron is actually a proton and a beta particle stuck together. A proton and an electron, essentially, stuck together. Now, the masses do bear this out because a neutron does weigh slightly more than a proton, and that slightly more amount is pretty close to the mass of that electron. So I would buy this. All right, now the idea is that when you've got too many neutrons, one of them will transform itself into a new proton by ejecting that beta particle, that electron portion of itself. So this electron portion of a neutron will come out as a beta particle. Notice they use a minus one charge and zero mass for it, just like they would for an electron. And so essentially then that neutron becomes a new proton, meaning that the daughter isotope is actually going to have an atomic number one greater than its parent. All right, well, let me show you a quick example of, of a beta emitter. Okay, I mentioned chlorine-40, you might as well use this one. Well, it turns out that when it ejects a beta particle, and again, they'll use the symbol beta minus one zero, or you can use the electron symbol. They use these synonymously with one another. I'll use the beta symbol here. Now, again, remember that numbers here have to be conserved. If a minus one charge came out of this, that means that the, the daughter isotope has to have an 18 here for the numbers on this side to add up to the original. So that means that this actually decayed to argon, an atomic number one greater than its parent. As a matter of fact, it's argon 40. So you can see that if you can add and subtract whole numbers here, this is not really a difficult task to figure out 
how to write a nuclear equation if you're told already what the mechanism is, meaning what particle is going to be ejected. Now, I think the one that we're using in lab today is thallium-204. And again, you'll find that if you use thallium-204 here and it ejects a beta particle, it's pretty easy to figure out what its daughter isotope is. Now, the last thing we need to talk about is gamma radiation. So let me pause here for a second and erase the board. All right, now gamma radiation, and the sample that we have, we had intended to use for the lab was cobalt-60. We've got some metastable cobalt-60 that's a gamma emitter. We have a very small amount of it that we keep in a lead cabinet in our stock room. But uh, again, the gamma photon is not actually a particle. Uh, I don't know how much your lecture instructors discuss this, but it's a, it's a photon. It's electromagnetic radiation. It's got a wavelength down in the 10 to the minus 12th meter range. So it's way down there past X-ray radiation. Very high energy, very penetrating. And by the way, I didn't mention before the beta particles. You know, they're a little faster than the alpha particles. And so consequently, they penetrate a little bit more. I'll discuss this a little later at your report sheet. But when we uh, did the demonstration with the Geiger counter last semester, we would use a, a high... Uh, high density tinfoil to stop, uh, heavy duty tinfoil to stop the beta particles. Uh, they'd sail pretty much right through notebook paper. The alpha particles could be stopped with the notebook paper, but the betas were a little bit more penetrating. But with the gamma, we need like a foot of lead to stop it completely. We used a quarter inch slab of lead in our demonstration last semester, and, and probably two thirds of the gamma photons went right through it. So again, if you want to shield yourself from gamma radiation, you're going to need several feet of concrete, oh, excuse me, several feet of concrete or a foot, a foot of lead. All right, now, essentially, gamma radiation accompanies a lot of other forms of emissions because, for instance, when an alpha particle gets ejected by a nucleus, it leaves kind of a hole in that outer shell. Remember where we looked at that shell model of how the nucleus is put together? Well, immediately the remaining nucleons rearrange themselves into a more comfortable arrangement. At the instant the alpha particle gets ejected, this nucleus is in what's called a metastable state and will, in the very next instant probably, rearrange the nucleons and belch out a little gamma photon to bring about its own stability. All right, well, again, I said we had some metastable cobalt-60 that sure enough is still emitting gamma photons that we could measure. All right, well, balancing these equations is really not much of a task, given that the gamma photon has no charge and no rest mass. So, for instance, technetium, commonly used isotope, uh, actually, technetium-95, metastable technetium-95, they create this, by the way, by introducing neutrons into this thing and can actually create the technetium on site so they don't have to store it anywhere like in a lead closet someplace. If they need this for uh, nuclear imaging, they can create enough of it that they can use and, and toss the rest. So again, just kind of a convenient way for, for using the radioisotopes in medicine. But it turns out that this, will actually cool down to just plain old technetium-95, plus it'll belch out a gamma photon. So again, there's nothing for you to do here. For all practical purposes, the atomic number doesn't change. The mass number doesn't change. It just went from being metastable, and the M disappears. And suddenly, it's the stable form of technetium-95. All right, well, one last thing we need to talk about before we go to the report sheet is the detection, the Geiger counter that we were going to actually uh, use to, to measure the shielding and the counts per minute of these radioactive samples. So let me just show you a quick picture of that. Okay, the Geiger counter is really actually a pretty simple mechanism. Basically, it's a metal can filled with argon gas. And it's got a little mica window down here in the bottom. Mica is a mineral that has a crystal structure with big interstitial spaces in it. Consequently, radioactive particles like an alpha particle are small enough to, to get through that. And a beta particle, even smaller than that, and a gamma photon doesn't care who it runs into. It just goes right on through. 
So what happens is this argon gas that's trapped inside the can is exposed then to these alpha particles, but the argon is such a big atom, it can't squeeze out through those little spaces in the mica. So the argon is pretty much sealed in there. Well, there's a big DC power source and a detector that can detect small glitches in voltage. And as ionizing radiation or alpha particles or beta particles or gamma photons enter that mica window, they crash into argon atoms, immediately creating an argon cation and an electron. Remember, helium could beat out argon for an electron in an ionization war there because helium is more electronegative. So it turns out that sure enough, that argon cation then crashes into the wall of the can right here. The electron would crash into the electrode in the center of the can and the detector would detect that little glitch in voltage and count that as one radioactive particle. All right, well, let's go to the report sheet. This was the Geiger counter that we were going to use for our demonstration. We had an alpha, beta, gamma source, and we were going to try different shieldings uh, in between it and the Geiger counter to show you how if we increase the shielding, the number of counts would drop. I'm sorry we can't do that demonstration, but we can have you write out the nuclear equations for each of those three sources that we had. All right, well, let's go to the report sheet, and we'll come back here to the board in a little bit and talk about kinetics. Okay, well, it's time for us to butcher our report sheet here because a lot of this we're not going to do. Please do put your name, however, on your, on your paper. Um, now, the alpha source, beta, and gamma, we were going to show you this in the Geiger counter, and I'm sorry I can't really reproduce that here. I could just make up numbers, but it's it really loses everything in the translation. Uh, it's much nicer just to see the Geiger counter clicking away here. But our alpha source, unshielded, usually gave us a couple thousand counts, and uh, it turned out with a paper shield, it dropped back down to about 70, <laughs> the background reading. And with a lead shield, it stayed at around 70, because once you got the paper, the alpha source couldn't really penetrate it. The beta source, unshielded, we had a nice active source, you know, and it likewise was over a thousand counts per, per minute. And a paper shield, it usually sailed right through, but the lead shield usually nailed it. And then the gamma source would just sail right through everything. The lead shield it usually knocked down about a third of the gamma source. Um, we had about a quarter inch slab of lead, and but about two thirds of the gamma photons would go through there. All right, well, given what we have just discussed at the board about how to balance alpha decay reactions and beta decay reactions in gamma, the alpha source that we had intended to use was polonium-210. I'd like you to go ahead and write out the, the alpha decay reaction for polonium-210. Uh, let's see, and what's its atomic number? I think I have it right here in front of me. Yes, number 84. Uh, although you could go to the periodic table and find that one. And then thallium. I'm trying to think what the atomic number is on the thallium. I'm sorry, I don't have it right here in front of me. Let's take a quick look. I think it's 81. Uh, is our beta source, thallium-204. So again, I'd like you to write out uh, an equation for its decay. And then likewise, here we've got cobalt-60. In a metastable state, this was our gamma source that we used. And the reason we chose these is because they had reasonable half-lives and would, you know, we could buy a small, small sample and keep them in a lead container and uh, and they'd last a while. But again, just write me out a, 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 a decay, a gamma decay for the cobalt-60. All right, well, let's go, go back to the board. I want to discuss a little bit about the kinetics before we get to question number four. Okay, a little refresher course on first-order kinetics way back chapter 14, I think the beginning of the semester, we talked about the fact that a first order time concentration equation we derived looked like this. Now we did derive a, a little more user-friendly form of it that looked like this, where we could say, well, the, the natural log of the amount of reactant at time t divided by the reactant at time naught was equal to minus kt. That allowed us to just use a ratio here, and we could do percent type problems with this. But the original form of this equation looked like this. This was the first order time concentration. And we pointed out that in a graphical method, went back when we did our crystal violet experiment, we plotted the natural log of the crystal violet concentration on the y-axis, and we plotted time on the x-axis, 
and found that sure enough for crystal violet, we got a first order time concentration equation that was consistent with the data. That's what pointed us to the fact that the crystal violet reaction was first order. Well, again, the slope of that line represented the rate constant K and the intercept of that line represented the natural log of the crystal violet that we had started with. All right, so today what we're gonna do is look at some data that's from a radioactive decay where we took the Geiger counter and essentially just measured a sample over a, a period of time. All right, well, we've got plenty of data there and, and essentially then if we plot it out, just like we did with the crystal violet, we should be able to come up with the slope of that line. Well, the slope of that line would represent the decay constant then of that radioactive isotope. Remember, they call the rate constant the decay constant in this case. And since it's first order, that would tell us the half-life of that isotope. Because the half-life in a first order reaction is 0.693 divided by the rate constant. In this case, the decay constant. All right, so here's essentially what we're going to do. I'll show you this again when we get to the report sheet. We collected this data with uh, time and counts per minute. We did it, I think, over the span of an hour, and we've got counts per minute for you. We're going to plot the natural log of the counts per minute versus time. Because remember, this doesn't decay linearly. It decays logarithmically, like a first-order decay. So consequently, when we take the natural log of it, then we do come out with a nice straight line. The slope of this line, then, is going to be minus k the rate constant. Well, we can drop the negative sign because what we want is the rate constant itself, the k value. Because we're going to use that then to find the half-life of this radioactive isotope, which would be 693 over k. All right, well, I think that's, that's enough about the kinetics. Let's go ahead and go back to the report sheet and we can pretty much wrap this up. Okay, well, in the kinetics part of this experiment where we're going to have you do the graph, uh, we collected some data, and actually this is uh, data collected by students at ICC. We used to have a lab where we collected actual sample of radioactive thorium, and we would measure its uh, number of counts per minute in the Geiger counter over a span of about an hour. And with that, we could determine the half-life of the thorium. And again, it was pretty easy. We had the computer actually do the legwork and calculate the natural log of the counts per minute as it decayed because again this is first order kinetics so this is going to decay in a logarithmic fashion so if we plotted then the natural log of the counts per minute versus time we should get a straight line all right well i'm gonna i'd like you to turn in this page page six of the experiment or recreate it somehow so that i've got a data page for you a data table and I want you to manually calculate the natural log of each one of these counts per minute down the line. So there's a few of them for you to do. So again, either give me some recreated form of this data table or this page with just your natural logs written in there. Now it says, I think it may say in some of the older copies, to calculate the log base 10. Don't do that. We'll do a natural log. And we're going to put it in column C. That's what it says. Put it over here in column C. Now, we're going to plot the natural logarithm of the counts per minute on the y-axis and the, the time on the x-axis. Again, because this plot then should give us a plot that looks like this. Where if I've got the natural log of counts per minute on the y, time on the x, and again, I gave you a piece of graph paper scaled, per, I think, pretty well to get everybody on scale. Well, you'll note that in all the data points fall in a nice straight line. So lay a ruler on there, draw your best straight line through them. I'd like you to manually determine the slope of that line. And again, you can do that by arbitrarily just choosing two data points. You can even choose it right here at zero and out at the very end and just decide exactly, you know, what the rise and run was between those two data points. And that would be your slope. Remember, that's equal to minus K. So because the the rise was actually a negative number so this is why the slope comes in negative remember the t1 half the half life then since we made all these measurements up above in minutes the time was in minutes 
the T one half is going to come out in minutes, and it's 0.693 divided by k. So on, you know, again, make sure that you record this value then uh, on your report sheet or on your graph somewhere. All right now. Oh, that's right. On the report sheet, I think it was on question number four. Let me flip this over. There you go. Question number four says, from your plot of natural log of activity, LN, sorry, of activity versus time, what's the half-life of the unknown isotope? So just make sure you record that here on your report sheet where you did the nuclear equations in numbers one, two, and three. All right, now there were some more questions on the back page. Let me pull these up. I'd like, I'm going to leave this one up to you. It says, if you had a radioactive sample of table salt, so sodium chloride, how might you determine very quickly whether it was the sodium or the chloride that was unstable? Now, you can't just go up to it with, with a Geiger counter, go up to it with a Geiger counter, because they're both there together. Either one of them could be radioactive, and that's all you detect. So you have to figure out some way to segregate these two. How could we take some regular old table salt and somehow separate the sodium from the chloride. And I'd like you to be specific in this answer. We've looked at uh, precipitation methods. We've looked at electrochemical methods. Uh, there's two or three different ways that you could, you know, chemically get the sodium and the chloride separated in separate beakers and then check each one individually with a Geiger counter. So tell me the whole story here. Now, here's another first order time concentration equation problem in number six. It says the following data had been taken for highly radioactive thorium-226. Notice they've given you the elapsed time here. You can figure out in minutes. And they showed you where the counts started, where the counts ended. So this would be like uh, A at time naught, and this would be A at time T, given that this much T has passed. Well, given that data, you can find the rate constant K and if you know K, then you know T one half. And naturally, we couldn't pass, you know, giving you a couple other nuclear equations just to fill in the gap here. You know, what particle is actually being ejected? And again, it's just a matter of making sure that the atomic numbers balance and the mass numbers all balance. Should be uh, not too daunting to figure out what goes in the missing spots there. All right, so make sure, again, that uh, you've got the report sheet completely filled out. And this, I promise you, will be your absolutely, absolutely your last, last submission. Okay, well, that pretty much wraps that up. You got to admit that was just about painless. Uh, well, anyway, just make sure that you fill out uh, that report sheet. Make sure I get, you know, the full data page and, and the graph and all the, the answers to those questions that are on the back of the report sheet. And if you have any questions about it, again, don't hesitate. Just give me a shout. And as soon as uh, I get this last lab in, I'll get the lab scores to you. I'll show you all your scores. And so if you see anything there that looks hinky, just, you know, give me a shout uh, before I make them official and I send them off to the lecture instructors. So anyway, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, if there's ever anything I can do to, to help in your endeavors, please don't hesitate to contact me. All right, well, hope to see you around. So long.